Hello, and welcome to another lesson here at the Highland Church of Christ. We're in my, my home, and as we are gathered uh, on this day, and hopefully as you are viewing this as part of your own devotional uh, and uh, personal growth as we uh, worship today on the Lord's Day, uh, I know that there'll be those watching this uh, probably throughout the week, but I'm thankful if you're able to join us while this is going uh, and premiering on Sunday. Uh, and, and as we as Highland continue to uh, keep as much as we can our schedule that we have grown accustomed to with uh, having afternoon services together. One day, I believe we'll be able to do that um, again. What we're doing today is going to look at uh, the Gospel of John, and we're looking at John 15. This is a, another textual study that we're going to be doing and it is a, a study and a series of studies that I have been doing, and it's been helping me become a better Bible student. And I and I hope to share, I hope to share what I've been learning, in the hopes that it will help you also be a better Bible student. That's what these these uh, these lessons are going to be about. These textual lessons. Last time we looked at Matthew 18 verses 19 and 20, and we did a pretty deep walkthrough of of some, some aspects from a variety of different angles. Uh, for example, we made literary observations, grammatical observations, historical observations, and cultural observations to, to help us appreciate uh, and get to a closer sense of how this would have um, had meaning for its original recipients. And the same is true with what we're going to be doing today. So these lessons that we're doing, um, I'm going to put those sorts of items to the forefront of our study. And part of it is because as readers of Scripture, as you know, we are a people of the book, and we must be better and more proficient at being people of the book. Uh, for too long, we've, uh, we've at times substituted my observation, my experience, not maybe not yours, but my observation has been we've often substituted Scripture memorization, which is good and necessary and important, but we've often substituted mass quantities of Scripture memorization for, for spirituality, for relationship with God. And, and while that it is essential to store up as much Scripture in our heart as possible, uh, it, Scripture memorization is not the end. The collection of Scriptural verses is not an end within itself. And part of the process of reading scripture is being willing to try to get, you know, what did the original audiences or the original recipients, the readers, you know, the sender, what were they intending for those first people who read this passage to understand? That's what last week's uh, study was all about. And that's what this week's uh, scripture uh, study is going to be about also. And so as, as I give you a heads up, I hope you're grabbing a pen and paper and, and uh, hopefully uh, taking some notes that will help you uh, ask certain kinds of questions. And each text is going to be different. Uh, last week was a gospel account, Matthew. This is going to be another gospel account, John. But we're going, to, we're going to move around for a little bit. We have a few of these we're going to do together. And I hope that my observations will help you and also uh, provide um, additional help to your study of Scripture as we go through this together, as we try to be God's people based on His book together. So let's look at John 15, and we're just going to look at the first eight verses. I know in some English Bibles, the paragraph goes all the way to verse 11, and if your Bible doesn't have paragraphs, sometimes there's a little... Um, you know, embolden number or, or word or something that helps, you know, perhaps give you a sense of the, the paragraph shift. Uh, we'll read that uh, just up to verse 8, and we'll take into account the rest of the chapter, but, but we'll, our reading will just include that. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It's been the Bible that I've been using since 2001, so um, I'm pretty comfortable with it. There are other versions, of course, that you may use, but just if there's any word difference or uh, word choices that are different, uh, that will explain why. All right, John 15, verses 1 to 8. 
I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not, excuse me, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and branches, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. All right. So, 1 through 8. If you've never read this passage before, it, it is um, powerful. I hope you take a moment to imagine a vineyard. And I hope you take some time to kind of in your head, you see the, the lines of the, of the vine, right? Uh, at, lifted up on poles. Uh, and then perhaps there's these strong lines or ropes and the vine ties itself around it and begins to grow and, and move on throughout. And so you have these large, long rows. If you've ever gone by a vineyard, you, you'll see those rows. Uh, and it is, it is a sight to see. It is, um, it is one of um, those sorts of sights that often appear in California. If you go to the wine country or even in, in the valley, um, there are a considerable amount of, of uh, vineyards in the valley. And as you go even to the west and some of the, the mountain plains, as you go um, maybe toward like uh, San Luis Obispo or something like that, um, those sorts of places you, you'll see on the road on, on the way over, uh, maybe like a, here we take a trip from Bakersfield to go to Morro Bay or, or a Pismo and you will we'll see vineyards on the mountainsides. Well, imagine that and imagine that Jesus is saying, I want you to see that in your mind. For them, it would have been a real uh, probably most likely a real vineyard, um, and we'll get to this, but a vineyard was a common symbol or a common uh, icon in the culture of Israel. They would have seen them a lot. So imagine that, and then Jesus says, you see how the worker works and, and prunes and, and takes care of that vine, the vineyard. There are things that get removed in order to make that, that vine healthy or fruitful. Um, you see how that process works? There is something that I want to illustrate spiritually about our relationship and your relationship with God. And he says, this vineyard is me. My father, my father is the farmhand. He's the vine dresser, which is another word for a farmer. Um, same word is used, by the way, in Jesus' parable of the tenants, the wicked tenants in Matthew 21. But Jesus then gets a little deeper. He gets more intimate with the vineyard. And he tells this, this sort of quick story of the vine dresser goes in and he prunes and he cleans. He has maybe a little tool and he snips off dead, dead branches, fruitless branches that are, from a farmer's perspective, um, misdirecting nutrients that could be used for branches and vines that are producing a harvest are producing grapes so you so you can get your mind wrapped into this sort of cultural economical staple of Israel 
you know, this is how they got wine. Uh, this is how they, they got their table drink. Uh, this is, this was ultimately how they would, would have this, this beverage around. It was a significant part of their culture. And from this, we're supposed to understand something. Now, one might say this is a parable, which is interesting because uh, it functions much like a parable. Yet, it, there are many scholars that would argue that the Gospel of John has no parables. Uh, I, I personally do not agree with, with that point of view, and uh, it, it's possible. It's, it's one of those old views that, are, that has been you know, considerably questioned because Jesus has a lot of metaphors. Jesus ha offers a lot of illustrations, and a parable is an illustration with a comparison that has a spiritual meaning. Sometimes we'll say, we'll use a short uh, statement like, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, or you know, a, a true-to-life story with spiritual application. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we're, we, um, we're seeing something else other than a parable. I think this is a parable. Um, if you're more comfortable with graphic metaphor. Uh, I don't know if that is exactly a separate and apart thing from the idea of a parable, but for, for those of us who are trying to figure out what, what are we reading here? You know, what is this illustration about? What is this? Is this an analogy? Um, let's just play with the idea that this is a graphic metaphor and that this metaphor means something. And in this, we're going to learn something about abiding in Jesus, abiding in the Father. Uh, in this, we're going to learn something about our responsibility to uh, following Jesus, uh, being disciples, or using uh, the catchphrase, uh, discipling. Um, we need to ask ourselves, how, how does this apply to us? So, in the Gospel of John, which is um, a series of focused stories about Jesus and His teaching, and his deeds, in particular his ministry for three or so uh, plus years, and then his rejection, crucifixion, and then ascension. We are looking at one of his teaching moments, and he's using this uh, and in uh, sort of his last big speech to his disciples. So the, the Gospel of John has a major section near the end uh, Really, you can argue it, it. You can include chapter thirteen, uh, where Jesus is with his disciples and he offers them not just a communion, but you know he washes their feet, he gives them a new commandment, those things. Um, that sort of, sort of seems to be the the historic, you know, the narrative um, part of of the section. Sort of bleeds into what happens next. But this discourse proper seems to start off in chapter 14 and end in chapter 17. In chapter 14 of the Gospel of John, Jesus begins with the, the famous, do not let your hearts be troubled, uh, believe in God, believe also in me. And he says, you know, I'm going to my father's house, um, or in my father's house are many, many rooms, uh, not mansions, but rooms, um, spacious locales, but rooms. Uh, if it were not so, I would I would have told would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. So he he's preparing them for his departure, and this becomes you know a key element. Well, if Jesus is leaving, what happens to us, right? What happens to us? So we're answering now. We're trying to frame the the, the literary focus of the passage here um, by appreciating where we are in the book, and what happens when Jesus is gone. The disciples need both encouragement and they need a reminder of their relationship with God that will be long-standing even when he's gone, even when Jesus has reunited with the Father. Uh, that relationship will, be, uh, will not be broken. Uh, it will not be displaced even when Jesus is. It will remain the same. So that's why we get the powerful statement of one of these uh, I am statements in Verse 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, do you know him and have seen him? So Jesus is interacting with them, telling them that he is leaving, uh, where he's going, they can follow, 
Um, and they said, how do we know this? He goes, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And no man can come to the Father except through me. I am the access point to the Father. So chapter 14 begins a, a series of statements by Jesus of the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is sometimes called the paraclete uh, final discourse, uh, John 14 to chapter 16. Uh, and in it, the main focus is, even though Jesus is gone, the Holy Spirit will come, it will be with the disciples, it will be with the church, but it will be with the disciples in a very unique and particular way, I would argue. And, and it will guide them in all truth, it will be with them, it will teach them, it will be another uh, advocate or another paraclete, just like Jesus is. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, we have an advocate with the Father, it's, it's a similar word as comforter, uh, in Greek, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are identified with that kind of language in the New Testament. So Jesus is saying, even though I have to go to, to heaven or to the Father, uh, you are not going to be left alone. In fact, I think one of, the, one of the words he uses is you will not be left orphans. So in this discourse, this farewell discourse, as, as it is often called, uh, you get this encouragement that the Father will not leave you, I'm not going to leave you. The Holy Spirit's going to come and be with you. Uh, the Father will be glorified. Uh, I will be glorified. And all this is going to happen uh, very soon. So, um, I will not leave you orphans. Chapter 14, verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live and you also will live. So there's this massive promise um, that... That unity with Jesus is not going anywhere. It may look different, but it is not going anywhere. And, and yet, it's important for him to stress in verse 25, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So we get this promise. Uh, we get this promise from Jesus to the apostles, that the Holy Spirit's going to function as a reminder. The Holy Spirit's going to function as a teacher to them, uh, reminding them of the things that Jesus had said to them. So here we get um, sort of um, some foundational promises that led a lot of early Christians to look for the words of Jesus uh, that were written down by apostles, uh, people that knew Jesus because of verses like this. They wanted to make sure that they got the Holy Spirit words of Jesus. And ultimately, I believe that created one of the ways for people to collect the Bible, to collect the New Testament, because they said, if the Holy Spirit was with these apostles and, and they were reminding them of the words of Jesus, then I want what they wrote down. And that's, that seemed to be why the, the Gospel accounts uh, were the first agreed upon set of books uh, that these were from the apostles and therefore had the Holy Spirit and therefore authoritative. From that chapter 14, you get 15. Now I'm going to hop over to 16 and 17 because this, this is also important for our literary understanding of our passage. Um, in chapter 15, there is concern about persecution that will be coming. Uh, the world hated him. They're going to hate his followers. So get ready for you know persecution of any kind or some kind. Uh, and he warns them ahead of time so that when it happens, uh, they will remember uh, these things. Um, verse 21 of chapter 15, But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know that him who sent me. They don't know God. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would, have, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did... They would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written and their, in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So the, the assurity of the apostles and their ministry has to do with that he is with them, that that. That, that they are with him, and they've been with him from the beginning. The beginning of what? His ministry. And this ties in again with Acts chapter, chapter 1, as they, full, they fill in the role of the vacancy left behind by Judas, and they need someone who's been there at the beginning, at the baptism of John, and then up to the ascension when he goes up to the Father, and was there 
uh, when Jesus interacted with, went in and out among them. So a very particular group of people is under discussion here. So from a literary point of view, uh, this is anchored in a lot of stuff. What's going to happen when I leave? They're going to treat you like they treated me. Chapter 16 then reaffirms in a stronger way, a more focused way, the coming of the Holy Spirit and what that means for them and the joy they can experience throughout this, despite the sorrow of losing Jesus. Uh, I just can't imagine the idea of, of having Jesus in such an intimate way and now realizing he's going to be gone. I just, I, 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 I can't wrap my head around that. Um, because if I love him and I haven't even seen him yet, I can't imagine even being with him and, and love him more than I love him now uh, and then losing him like that. Um, so this, this chapter 16 is, is critical. The Holy Spirit's going to come and perhaps well, that's why most translators like the word comforter for the, for the Greek word par parakleton. Um, but nevertheless, Jesus is promising them uh, the word, the teaching of the Spirit uh, that, that was his, now he's giving it to them through the, the Spirit that the Father will send. In chapter 17, uh, you get what my professor, Dal Flat used to say, the Holy of Holies of the New Testament, because here you have Jesus, uh, the Word that became flesh, the Word that is God. John 1, verses 1 to 3, and verse 14, uh, is praying to the Father, uh, God the Father. This is God praying to God. Uh, this is a very powerful, intimate prayer. And in it, you get a lot of sense of the unity of Jesus and the Father. Uh, they are united, and they use this language, I am in you, and you are in me, and, and then we, Father, Son, are in the disciples. And they are with us. So this language of being in is a very important word, and we could talk about that when we get to some grammar, but, but I, want you to, I want you to appreciate, when you're reading a passage Try to find the beginning and the end of the, the main thought, the main unit of thought. Uh, and that will help you appreciate where this passage flows in the book you're reading. Uh, when we look at words or study scripture, sometimes we think, oh, let me just study the word, a single word, and that'll help me understand everything else. Now, word studies are important, but... Very rarely does a word study on its own shape the entire passage. You have to read top down the broader, the whole book or a broad section of the book to really appreciate what you're reading. And, and the same is true here. Uh, we need to know it begins right after uh, the upper room discussion and the washing of feet and uh, then transitions from the Lord's Supper to this, this uh, farewell statement, a very common theme in the Old Testament of great leaders leaving their disciples. The difference being the other, the other prophets of the Old Testament did a farewell and they never came back or, and they never promised a continuation. Jesus is saying, I'm going, I'll come back, but then I'm going to go to the Father and I will continue to be and you will continue to serve and our relationship will not end. That's a massive difference. So chapters 13 uh, sets the stage, 14 to 17 is this broad uh, farewell discourse, and chapter 17 really is this final prayer of unity for the disciples that they may be one as you and I are one, Father, and I am in them, right? And they are with us. Okay, so from a literary point of view, that's one of the things I wanted to point out. And in this, in this section then, um, this comparison this analogy, this parable, uh, is signaling to us something about the grapevine, something about discipleship and the grapevine and us being branches. Now, sometimes interpreters have come across and said, oh, this is about various different kinds of denominations. This is not about denominations. Uh, this is about individual disciples abiding in the single uh, vine of Jesus. Uh, this is about in, in, individual corporate uh, discipleship when it comes to following Jesus. But in the analogy then is really important to, or the metaphor, as, as I've stressed, this metaphor really is important to bring back to what the disciples would have applied to themselves. They wouldn't have thought, oh yeah, yeah, this is going to, this is going to be good. You know, Baptists and Catholics and all of us are going to be, you know, these different churches that will emerge you know, hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of years before 
before, uh, you know, we ever heard about them. No, that's not what this is about. This is about the disciples themselves talking to Jesus and Jesus calling them to faithfulness. Keep asking them to maintain connection to the vine. So there's, in this comparison, the important repetitions of things like abiding, things like the branches, things like bearing, and then what do you bear? What do you bring forth? You bring forth fruit. And the importance of where the Father is in all of this. The Father has a massive role in this. It's not just Jesus. It is the Father, like the cultivator, the farmer, who is you know, going through the aisles and going through these, these agricultural lanes of grapes and, and maybe examining them and seeing if they're healthy, see if maybe if there's a fungus that's gone on them, or maybe there's something that's killing a particular vine, and, and he is going to do what he can to prune it, to take care of it. Uh, that's some important things. So when you think about the comparison and the repetitions, uh, that is really an important part here of, of some literary things to think about. Grammar is, can be a really helpful tip uh, to what Jesus is saying. Uh, there are two words that I've spent some time looking at. And what we will simply look at is just a few important points. Uh, there are two verbs that I think, um, if you're going to make sense of this passage, you can't ignore. Uh, they are the verb to abide and the verb uh, to bear. Um, the verb to abide, or the Greek word meno, uh, is, is a very flexible word. It, it, can, re, it can refer to uh, remaining. Uh, it can refer to dwelling. Uh, it, it basically says you stay put within, in connection to something. You can abide in a house. Uh, you can remain in a circle. Uh, you know, it is sort of this, this, you stay put, you, there are confines, there are limits, and these limits determine whether you are in, you are biting in, or you have gone beyond. And it is that concept here that Jesus is saying, I don't want you to pass a certain limit, because once you've crossed it, you are not abiding, you are, you know, unabiding, uh, you have gone beyond. I want you to abide. So he, he is putting up some walls by this word. And it is used throughout this entire section uh, where he talks about abide in me. Um, he uses it uh, to emphasize the urgency, the priority of abiding in Jesus. Look at verse 4. Um, abide in me and I in you. Look at verse 9, something very similar. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in me. Uh, these are strong, these are words of urgency. In fact, they're not commands necessarily. They, they distress an urgency. You know, this, he's not saying do something brand new. He's saying you were probably already doing this, but you need to remember to abide. This is the stress of the passage. There's an urgency here. Keep doing it. Uh, or maintain that. And, and so by this you get the, the, the emo emotional impact of what Jesus is saying by the grammar. We need to take the urgency seriously. And I got to say, it's a hard thing to do to stay urgent every day. It is a hard thing to stay urgent or convicted every single day. Well, how can I abide in Jesus today? How can I work on that? Well, it may be difficult, but it is part of our responsibility. There's, we can either abide, a branch can either abide in the vine, which means it, it gains its nutrients from it, or it cannot, which means it's cut off because it's already dying. It's already withering away. So uh, there, there really is no distinction there. I mean, in terms of um, understanding the difference between abiding and not abiding. The urgency is there. We must be urgent also. Uh, the other thing I want to point out here is, is um, there are times in this where he uses abide in a way that he uses sort of a, 
a logical if then situation. Uh, he uses a logical if and argument. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at uh, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now this picks up one of our other verbs, and we'll transition over to that in just a second, uh, the idea of bearing. But look at this, I am the vine. So, I am the grapevine. He's keeping this metaphor. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me, or if you abide in me, and I in you. Right? Here's the if part, the, log the logical argument. If you abide in me, and I in you. So, this is a reciprocal relationship. You know, you can't really talk about a branch that's, a, that's bearing fruit unless it's connected to the vine. Right? So he's saying, if you're abiding in me, and therefore bearing a fruit, and I in you, you, he it is, this person is the one who is bearing much fruit. Why? Because apart from me, you can do nothing. There's a logical argument here. If you do this, then you can do this. If you can do this, you will do this. If you abide, you will bear fruit. Because Bearing fruit is impossible if you're not in me. A, a branch that's cut off, pruned off, no longer has the resources to create grapes. And the same is true about Christians. A, a Christian who is cut off from the, the, the spirit of Jesus, however that could happen, cannot produce fruits of Christianity cannot. So Jesus gives a strong logical warning. Because our, our goal here, Jesus' goal for us, is to bear fruit. He's not a vine for nothing. You don't have grape vines for nothing. You don't just have them out there looking pretty because you like a mountain covered with vineyards. You want, or a vine, right? You, you want the vine, you want a vineyard because you want the harvest. There's an expectation that Christians will bring a harvest to God. That means we have the important job to bear fruit. And the only way we bear fruit is when we're connected to Jesus or when the branch is connected to the vine. In two cases, we learn about different kinds of branches. And look at this in verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, all right, there's one kind of branch. The father, the vine dresser, the, 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 the farmer, he takes it away, all right? And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So there's two kinds of branches. One that bears fruit, grapes, and one does, does not. To the one that doesn't, this is what happens, right? If you've ever been around an orchard or if you ever worked with plants and you're, you're, you're growing them, he says, the one that does not bear fruit, he takes it away because it's killing the plant. It's not producing. It's not helpful for the harvest. It's redirecting necessary nutrients. But the one that is bearing fruit, oh man, you take care of that. You nurture it, you hang it, you know, you keep it clean, you prune it, those things. So there's a lot of tension to detail going on here. So the father then is described in these ways. But we learn about two different branches. So the question is, what branch do you want to be, right? Um, do you want to be the branch that is bearing fruit? Or do you want to be the branch that isn't bearing fruit? In the, the graphic metaphor, the one branch that isn't bearing fruit, that's the one that gets cuts off and thrown throw in the garbage and dealt with, destroyed. Is that the one you want to be? I hope not. Jesus wants us to be branches that bear fruit. And so, as we think about those two verbs to help us appreciate this text, Helps us get a sense of what Jesus is saying, where his urgency is, and where our urgency needs to be. Um, what's so big about the metaphor about a branch or about a vineyard? Well, 
it might not surprise you, or maybe it will, but in my study, I've learned also that the vineyard, the vineyard is a common symbol in the Old Testament for Israel, for Israel itself. Um, I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 80. And maybe you've, maybe you've never seen this before. And uh, up until this point, you know, without looking at this passage much, um, it took me some time to really uh, appreciate that how important a vine concept was for describing Israel. Listen to this, Psalm 80, <clears throat> beginning in verse 8. Now you can read the whole psalm, and the psalm is important all by itself, but, but um, listen to this. Verse 8, the psalm talking to God says, You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. And it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls? So that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit. The boar from the, from the forest ravages it. And all that move in the field feed on it. So in this psalm, um, <clears throat> this psalm is a testimony of Asaph. Um, there is this sort of great concern. And it could be called a lament. Because the verse 1 says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Uh, and in this lament, there is this grave concern that despite all that God has done for Israel, you know, sort of leaving Israel with this, this great uh, vine, sort of, you know, he took it out of the ground and he still had it maybe wrapped up and packaged in some dirt and he watered it and he kept it going from, you know, Egypt all the way to the promised land. Uh, this sort of idea of trying to maintain this, this, this dying plant until he could plant it in the ground. Uh, he succeeded in doing it, and then when he finally gets there, it takes off. The plant just takes off, and it covers the mountains, you know, like these, these, you know, these vineyards that we see on the hillsides. It just took over, and as it thrived, Israel, for some reason, right, a vineyard would have uh, walls to protect it. It says here that someone broke the walls of this vineyard. And now when people are just strangers, people who do not, who did not plant the, the vineyard are eating from it. This idea of, of taking what is God's and taking it for themselves. And, and then there's this other metaphor of a wild animal, a boar that gets into um, the vineyard and starts eating this hanging fruit uh, it was never designed for wild animals. It was never designed for other people outside of this person who had, you know, caravaned with this tender plant to plant it somewhere else. Um, that's Israel. That's Israel. And yet, when we read throughout the, the Old Testament, um, the language of a vine that God planted that eventually degenerates into something else is very clear. For example, in Isaiah chapter 5, in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, listen to this. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard. All right. And on a very fertile hill, he dug it and cleared it of stones, and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. All right, so here is this person going into business, and he loves, you know, it's, this is a labor of love. And this is, you know, he's looking forward to, you know, the harvest of grapes. He was looking forward to wine, celebration. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge me, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard? Have I not done it? What more, do, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? 
So it's not cultivated grapes, wild grapes. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned for ho or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, and are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Verse, verses 1 to 7 of, of Isaiah 5 show us that Israel at, at, in Isaiah's day had degenerated from being in this symbol, right, of a protected, established vineyard, right? And the vintage that comes from it starts off with from wild grapes. Now, I'm not a wine connoisseur, Viticulture, or sort of the, the the industry of wine, is is not my specialty. Um, I've never been to a wine testing, but I understand the difference between um, bitter and sweet. Uh, I understand the difference between uh, you know um, something that has not been um, cultivated and something that is wild, and often the wild is has a unique spike to it, you know, um, it's not a cultivated taste or anything like that. Um, sometimes it is what, how things look and there's a lot of differences. The point is, this is not what God planted for. This is not God's intention. And Israel has chosen to become a wild fruit. Israel has chosen to be a wild vine. It has degenerated away from God's purposes. And as a result, it becomes an image of failure, moral, spiritual failure, uh, spiritual adultery, spiritual uh, in unfaithfulness. So when Jesus then comes along the scene and assumes this role, this, this image in his teaching, the vine culture, the, the vine or the vineyard uh, image becomes a massively important part of his teaching ministry, especially in the parables, which supports my parable theory here for John 15. Um, we see Jesus embrace the vine as a symbol for his, not only his identity, but for God's people. In chapter 15, verse 1, he says, I am the true vine. Is he saying, I'm the true Israel? You know, Israel has failed. Israel, the Israel of, of biblical history never lived up to its potential. Me, as a Jew, according to the flesh of the house of David, I'm an Israelite. I represent the true vine. I represent what God intended with the true vine, with the vine. And in this great I am statement, which we'll talk about in just a second, he is affirming that the symbol applies to him. And that what he is doing and creating from him as a part of this planted vine, right? You have the Israelite vine that God planted and it just kept, you know, degrading and, and failing. Jesus saying, I'm from that stock, but I am exactly what I am the lineage, right? Of that plant, you know, uh, uh, family tree of this plant. And I'm going to produce a produce the, the true vintage that God has been wanting. I am the true vine. I am the true vine. Jesus is emphasizing this symbol in his teaching. This symbol is about the kingdom. This symbol is about what God is doing if we let him in our lives. We will bear fruit as true Israel because Jesus is the true vine. He is truly the one from whom all things flow and have a harvest. The true vine informs us about the divine status of Jesus and how God wants us to have a communal relationship with him through Jesus. God is the gardener. And so this is more of a hands-on analogy that within Jesus we have a hands-on relationship with God. Finally, I want to point out some, uh, not just some, you know, historical, you know, biblical connections here, but I want to point out some cultural things here that might be pretty helpful. 
it's really great to see Jesus using the, the culture around him. Too many times we are afraid of culture, but Jesus is willing to point to things that were cultural and, and helped him illustrate his teaching. Uh, as I said before at the beginning, a vineyard was a typical element in the culture of the land of Israel. Vineyards were everywhere. Uh, fruit and vine, uh, fruit and wine were everywhere. Uh, and Jesus, Jesus used this popular knowledge, this sort of, yeah, we know about vineyards, and yeah, maybe I work at a vineyard. Um, and I understand the idea of farmers. Um, and so when Jesus is appealing to this, he's appealing to a, a cultural phenomenon that, that it would there, there would have been no need to explain. Unlike me, I'm a city kid. I grew up in San Francisco. I, I had never seen an actual vineyard. The closest thing I'd ever seen uh, of a vineyard were the grapes that came in packages at the Safeway. That is as close to grapes in the dirt that I got. You know, I thought for a long time, silly me, you know, that grapes just came that way. You know, and never thought that they were part of some big, massive, you know, uh, product on the farmlands. In Israel, you would not have lived like that. In a culture that was still extremely agricultural based, you would not think like that. When I ended up living in a small town called Livingston in the Valley of California preaching, I lived on um, a almond orchard and I got to get a sense and experience of, of what that looked like and what the farmer's life looked like. Um, and the hands-on approach at different times of the year and how these plants were an investment and took a lot of time to water them and wait for a harvest to come. And then you had these plants for so many years and then you had to restart with a new, with a, with a new set of plants, with a new set of almond trees. They would have understood that. There was no explanation needed. All Jesus was doing was, I want to point to a particular part of what our everyday knowledge of this culture is. And he did it very well. And he said, as the farm owner and the farmer who works the land, that's God. And he is using me to be the vine. And off of me hangs or bears other grapes. And these grapes are you. And if that branch that produces your, you and your grapes is producing, bearing fruit that hangs, then we're going to take care of that. But if you are not like that and nothing hangs off of you, we're going to see that you're not, for whatever reason, as a branch and gets cut off. That's as common, you know, farm hand knowledge. You take care of stuff. You know, I doubt they feel emotionally connected, but that's not what Jesus is saying. We're not emotionally invested in these people. He's just saying, look, look at what happens. That is a symbol. That is a sign. That is practicality. You know if you're in, in really invested in what we're doing in the kingdom of God or not. Be invested. The urgency. Bear. Abide in me. Bear fruit. And finally... When Jesus is using this and appealing to himself and the Father, there's some language here that is reference our relationship to God. Of course, the word Father in the book of John is the predominant word used for God. You know, uh, most uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke will talk about God, use, use God. Uh, they will use the word Father, but John uses the word Father more abundantly than all of them. And it is very clear that Father, then, is a divine title for God. But we also know from John 1 that Jesus is the Word and is God also. And, and this becomes a, a tricky question. You know, who is more God? <laughs> you know, Jesus or the Father? Um, that is a serious question, but one that uh, in the Gospel of John, um, we are not given any notion that there's a superiority except in terms of role. When the Word is flesh, 
the Word is obedient to the Father and the Father's will already expressed in the law, in the Scriptures. And Jesus, as a true Israelite, is going to be submissive to that. But we also see that Jesus is every but every bit as much divine as the Father. He forgives sins. He does miracles. He is not a prophet only. He is God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus does so. And so we see that when Jesus then uses language like, I am. Here we have him use that term, the I am. I am the true vine, verse 1. He's appealing to something throughout. Uh, he, this is the seventh time Jesus will say that in connection to a, a teaching and a pronouncement. Uh, that phrase it, it does appear several times structurally, I am, echo a me. Uh, but here he's using it in such a way where it echoes an important statement in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3, uh, verse 16, especially in the, in the Greek text. Where, G, where, the, where Moses asks, who shall I say sent me when he goes back to Egypt and God says, I am that I am. Ego a me. Um, Jesus is saying something that they would have gone, he's claiming a divine status. He's using a divine language. Uh, he's referring to himself in the same category as the Father. And this isn't the first time. You know, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, that he was about to get stoned by the, by the Pharisees because, because, not because of a miracle he made, but because he made himself equal to God. So Jesus is not a, above, so to speak, claiming his, his, his equality with God. Uh, he does so. And this is one of those cases. So what, are we, what does this all in a nutshell have to do with interpretation and, and doing their best we can to understand the text? Well, on the one hand, I want to emphasize that when we take time to understand a passage from its broader context, we are closer to understanding the author's intent of the book or the story or the letter. And that's what we were doing earlier, trying to understand that chapters 13 and then really 14 to, to 16 and then 17 sort of become these bookends uh, those, those chapters, 14 to 16, really are part of a farewell discourse where Jesus is departing and he's worried. Uh, he wants to make sure his disciples are not worried or too, you know, um, um, depressed uh, that they're losing Jesus. No, if you abide in me and my word in you, uh, then, and my commands abide in you, then, you know, we will be, we will have an intimate relationship together. So that helps us. When we get into some of the grammar, that further establishes that we're on the right track, especially when we look at the words abide and to bear. Um, when Jesus is using the phrase abide, they are talking about an indwelling with the Father. And that's something that we long to do as well. But it's not just with the Father, it's also with Jesus. So if you have it with Jesus, you have it with the Father. So despite his presence being gone, it's not. The relationship is still there. And when we look at the historical connection of why that symbol, why the vine, we begin to see how it Jesus has been using or is using in his teaching ministry a symbol of Israel that has a rich history in the Old Testament. And now he's applying it to himself. And we're in the continuation of that story of what Israel could be. And now it's done through the true vine, Jesus and culturally then, this is a metaphor or, or a parable, as I'd like to argue, that didn't need external, extra explanation like maybe we do today. But it is a powerful cultural observation that these farmhands can represent God. Uh, these farmhands that, that make sure that the vineyard is going well and smooth and pruning what needs to be pruned and cleaning what needs to be cleaned and branches off the vine that aren't producing will be taken off so that those that will produce can continue to, to, to provide a harvest. And this becomes a picture. Right? This becomes a, a picture of, of divine judgment. It becomes a picture of, of um, discipleship. It becomes a picture of faithfulness. Uh, and we need to ask ourselves some personal application questions. And as we close, that's exactly what I want to do. 
As we understand then that this passage that Jesus is teaching his disciples that despite his departure to the Father, chapter 14, verse 3, the intimate union with the Father that they have experienced through Jesus will remain so long as, catch it, they remain or abide in his teaching and in his word. Chapter 15, verse 2 and 7. So this means for us today, application, we need to start consuming the words of Jesus and commit his sayings to our heart. Yes, memorization is a critical application, but it's not the only one. Because if we know God's word, we know Jesus' word, commit it to our heart, and learn to avoid false imitations of spiritual growth, we will continue to abide and bear fruit. We need to learn to make Jesus' words and actions our words and our actions. And we need to celebrate also, we need to learn to celebrate that because of our relationship with Jesus, we have a relationship with the Father. And we, because of that, the work of the Spirit is being fulfilled. All right, thank you so much. Uh, these lessons are a bit longer than our um, maybe 30-minute Sunday afternoon messages, but I hope that they prove to be helpful for you and to give you uh, some ways to, to uh, help you in your Bible study. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye. Hey, thank you so much for watching our videos and content. If you want more videos, more content, and want to know more about us, visit our website or subscribe to us on YouTube and like us on Facebook. We'll see you next time.